All right, I think that we are mostly here. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, <clears throat> we're trying out some technical stuff here, so I apologize in advance if things get a little weird at times. Um, I'm gonna ask anyone, anyone in the audience to turn off your video if possible. So I wanna welcome all of you and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I am Kim Hoagland, I'm the Acquisitions Editor at Oregon State University Press, and I will be moderating our conversation with Gloria, Gloria Brown this afternoon. Um, I will introduce Gloria, she'll talk for a bit about her life, her work, and her book. Her book. Um, and then we'll have time at the end for a Q&A. So if you have questions, um, just go ahead and pop them in the chat window and then I will pose them to Gloria at the end. Uh, so. Gloria Brown is the first African-American woman to become a forest supervisor in the U.S. Forest Service. Her 30 plus years in the service began with an administrative role in Washington, D.C. and took her to forests throughout the West, including Montana, California, and Oregon. Along the way, she raised three children, qualified as a forester through OSU, and won numerous awards for her work mediating conflicts between the government and environmentalists. OSU Press published Gloria's memoir, Black Woman in Green, Gloria Brown and the Unmarked Trail to Forest Service Leadership, uh, just a couple of months ago in March. Uh, we'll be offering a discount today for anyone who orders the book through our website and we'll paste um, the ordering information for that in the chat window. It's 30% off and free shipping. And just as a final FYI and matter of housekeeping, we are recording this event and we will post it online um, afterwards for anyone who wants to rewatch or who wasn't able to join today. So introductions are done. I'm gonna to toss it over to Gloria, get to the good parts. Uh, Gloria, would you like to start off with a story? Oh, one second, Gloria, you're muted. <laughs> Okay. Now, can you see me? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I want to start off by um, thanking Kim, you and Marty for putting this together. I appreciate it. And all of those who've come to get feedback on my book and from me, and who just want to see what I look like after 20 years, are very, very welcome. I'm glad you are here. So with that, I'll jump right in, Marty. Go ahead, yep. Oh, my, my face isn't up there. Um, Just your face. <laughs> oh, my face isn't supposed to be up there. I'm supposed to just talk. Okay, so I will start with the beginning. Um, I never planned to work for the Forest Service um, after a tragic accident and my husband died. My, um, I was going to work for the bottom of the, the um, media, uh, radio medium or, or reporter. But my husband died and he made the most money so I could not afford to do that. So I'm left with, okay, what do I do now? And I had been in the Forest Service for probably eight, nine years. And I looked around and I saw all these white men making decisions about national forests. And I thought to myself, this is probably why a lot of people of color don't come. But, but it wasn't the reason. The, the reason that people of color didn't come is that we have never done a really good outreach to tell them uh, to say, join us. And so um, that was one of the change ag agents I had wanted to be in the Forest Service. So a bunch of people in the Washington office told me I could never do it. And that just gave me more power to go and achieve my goal. And my goal was to become a forest supervisor in the Pacific Northwest. 
And so I left Washington, D.C., my church, my mom and dad, my siblings, my friends. Um, you can only imagine what a tree looks like when it's uprooted. Um, and so me and my kids were uprooted, and we ended up in Missoula, Montana. I thought I was going to Atlanta, Georgia, but I ended up in Missoula, Montana. Big Sky Country is everything they say it is. It's beautiful. I've never seen that many stars in Washington, D.C. Flathead Lake does take your, bre your breath away. Um, Mission Mountains. It's, it was just a beautiful country. Um, and I, I liked it. I liked the work I was doing. Um, I was doing some work on wilderness management with staff and um, my, my, Mark Bacchus <laughs> trying to put through a, a new wilderness bill. I was making a video for the, um, for the regional forester, uh, diversity video for the regional forester. So I did a lot of good things. Unfortunately, my kids didn't like it. They said, Mom, all they do is run their cars down the strip and back chew, smoke cigarettes, and that's it. And they didn't do any of that. So they didn't like it at all. But the three of them went into the school. Uh, we'd have conversations every night about how we need to make this work for mom and for you. And so they went into the school, and they actually doubled the population for African-American children in the school. I found that quite interesting. And the, and the three that were already in there were Missoulians. They were born in Missoula. They knew how to fish. They knew how to shoot. They were different. So the kids had a, a little bit of trouble finding a niche. Um, my son found a niche in, in um, sports. My youngest daughter found a niche and uh, uh, seeked out friend. And my middle girl found a niche with the bourgeois girls coming back and forth to school. Anyway, make a long story short, there was an incident and the two girls were suspended. Let's talk about racism. Let's talk about people who don't understand people. So they were both suspended. And then I was told by my kids that the basketball captain, who, who was also suspended, was practicing for her, her game, homecoming game in Kalispell. And I'm like, I, brought, I got out the book that has the rules. And on the rules, you're not supposed to do any curricular activities. So I called to see the principal, and the principal wasn't there. And the assistant principal let, agreed to talk to me. And after our niceties, I was saying, you know, Mr. Bow, I don't, I don't understand why she's being lifted from her suspension, and my daughter is made to stay inside her suspension. And he said to me, without any pre pretext or anything, he says, Mrs. Brown, we didn't have these kind of troubles till your kids came to this school. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't cry in his face. I walked the hell out. I said good day. And, uh, Forest Service is a great organization. It will take care of its people. So when my regional forester found out that this guy had done that, um, he called the superintendent. Superintendent called the principal. The principal called me that evening and we met. It turns out that the girl's father was abusive and they were afraid if they told her that she couldn't play because she had started a fight, he would have, and his Kalispell is their hometown, 
he he might have hurt her. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? Did anybody think the hurt that was being put upon my daughter? Did you think about it? Honestly. And he said, no. And I said, that's too bad. Because if I was going to stay here in Montana, I would have a lot of work to do. But as it turned out, we were transferred out of Montana to Portland, Oregon, where I was a, a liaison between the chief and the um, legislature and other uh, information jobs. And um, met a lot, a lot of regional people, great people, came, they, they became my friends. Um, and I guess this is probably where I should talk about um, if people tell you you can't do something, don't listen to them. It takes courage, I know. But if you put your mind to it, you can do whatever you want to do. This would have this would have been an impossible journey to make. I didn't speak timber. I didn't speak environmentalists. I didn't speak white little rural communities. I, I, you know, I had to go and learn a whole new language. But it didn't stop me because I was headed for a goal. On the way, however, you want to find mentors. You want to find people who will support you. You want to find people who understand your goals and they're going to help you to get there. And with these people, you're going to develop some relationships. It's very important to be able to communicate, to listen, and to build relationships. Uh, I have a few examples of how important that was. When I was in Eastern Oregon, um, I had a rancher who was, whose cows were overgrazing. And the guys came in and said, well, you know, what are we gonna do about it, boss? And I said, well, call him on the phone. And then they called him. And I said, can I, can I come out and meet with you about this overgrazing? of your cattle? And first he said, um, what? I said, may I come to see you to discuss the overgrazing of the cattle? He said, sure. I went out, his wife fixed some biscuits and coffee, and um, he says, you know, no, no management, ever, no leadership ever came to me. I always had to go to their office. Now what I was doing in that action was trying to have him stay in a safe, comfortable place so we could talk versus in my office where I would look supreme and it might get sticky. So he, um, he told me how much he appreciated it. And then we started talking about how we could do the cows um, and stop the overgrazing. And the main thing I needed him to do was to move them. You can't just lay up, let them stay on the allotment. They'll eat every piece of grass that's there. You've got to move them. He said, okay, I'll, ha I'll hire another hand and we'll make sure that they graze and then they move. I just want to really appreciate you for coming out and figuring out what we could do and still be, I could still be successful. That's just one. Another relationship was done with the Nez Perce Indian tribe. That 
the, the tribe wanted their tribal land. They, they go after it whenever they can. And they do, they knew that um, Forest Service did land exchanges. And so he, they came to me, the chief and a couple of his um, assistants came to me and asked, I'd already had a reputation and had already been to a couple of their um, smokeouts, smoke, uh, salmon parties. But he came to me and he said, Gloria, is there any way you can get Mr. Bartlett to sell Forest Service or trade Forest Service land for him? His land is right on top of our grazing area where we pick out fruits, where we pick out plant out flowers. It, it was their sacred ground. So I said, well, I'll try. And my staff and I did um, a couple of suggestions. We took a map. No, I don't want that. Okay, we went back to the drawing board. We took a couple more maps. And he looked at them and, no, I don't want that. And so then I said, well, what would you trade for the land? And he said, nothing. I don't want to trade anything. He said, well, that's great. So I don't like failing. And I went back to my office and I had a relationship with uh, Lands for Public Trust. And Lands for Public Trust will buy land, keep it, and, and then either sell it or give it to an organization to take care of. And that's what they did in the case of the Nez Pierce. They bought the man's land and then turned the deed over to the Nez Pierce. They gave me all the credit. I'm like, God, this was trust for public land. She said, but if you had not had that connection, we would not have our sacred site. Relationships, so, so important. Um, I want to talk about, because this is higher, ranchers and miners, you know, the ranch people, they graves. That's the first guy I saw. And the miners, they mine their claims. Well, the, the, I'm going to start with the miners. They, they um, BLM changed the rules on them. And some of them just, they, they don't, they don't read well. It was confusing to them. So I sent my mining specialist out and he gave courses for those guys and helped them fill out their paperwork they thought i was an angel from heaven because they were able to keep their um their gold mine yeah the gold mine. um but i was just doing my job that's the, serving the people. That's how you do your job. That's why your job is so much fun, because you can serve the people. You don't have to tell them no, no, no. You don't have to say we're only going to cut timber. You don't have to. It, there's so many ways to build relationships. So I got an a, a honorary miners association certificate from them. And then I was hanging out with the, with the ranchers, and um, one of the ranchers had asked me if I'd seen a cow first. I said, no. He said, well, would you like to see one? It's, it's a, I have one that's about to come. And I said, sure. So I went home, got my jeans on. The cow, <laughs> he sent me a car. The cow was in a breach 
birth. I felt so bad for that cow, that calf, because they were pulling it and pulling it. And finally, whew, they pulled it out. And just like our little babies, they got this stuff on, on them and they rinse them off and they go on about their business. But that was, it was a remarkable scene of wildlife labor. So, um, so I did a lot with them. I, ran, I, I rode with them, make sure they were moving their horses. Uh, in the end, the, the Ranchers Association also gave me an honorary to, um, to an honorary Forrester, Forrester Rancher certificate. So I guess there's, there's some things, some, some um, skills that I really want to make sure people know what happened that I was able to use. And so some of those, um, some of those skills is listening. Some of those skills is being able to communicate. Some of those skills is, are being, um, being able to mentor. Some of those skills are being able to make hard decisions. Some of those skills are doing something that's scaring you to death. So an example of the scaring you to death, I was in Montana and they were taking me on a um, trail ride into the Bob Marshall Wilderness when we were going to stay one night and come back. Well, I'd never been on a horse. And so um, I, I'd never been on a beast that big. My bicycle wasn't that big. Um, but they got me up there. And um, our, um, our guide, Bucky, looked just like I thought he would, bow-legged and worn and one of those not a cowboy hat, but one of those other kind of hats. But I want to read you something. I'll tell a story. I, um, I really love Montana because it's Despite the worst case scenario happening, I did not let you guys know it was wonderful because I learned how to fly, I learned how to put out fires, I learned how wilderness management, I learned um, all kinds of forest service actions, behaviors that I didn't know in Washington, D.C. This was hands on. So, Let's move on to Portland. Did I leave out some skills? If I did, you'll hear them come through as I talk. Um, let's, talk let's talk about Portland. Portland was pretty cool. Oh, this is what I wanted to read you. <clears throat> I felt sad about leaving Montana. I had been naive about it. But I'd also learned that if I set my mind to it, I could do just about anything. I had ridden the horse, set up camp, cooked outdoors, learned to fight fire, learned to fight fire, putting up tents, tents making new friends, and drinking brewery beer, which I'd never drunk before then. I'd been able to help women and became the, to focus on civil rights. When I arrived, the beauty of big sky country 
it felt like I was enveloped. It had enveloped me like a blanket. And now I just feel cold. And that was me leaving Missoula. So I'm in the land of the Spotted Isles and I'm in the regional office. And um, I'm learning everything I can along with my assignments about these issues because they, they, they were big. Spotted Owl and, and Salmon, um, Marble Marola, they were all big issues, endangered species. So um, I was there probably a year. Uh, like I said, I like to read a lot and I read up on everything about the Spotted Owl and went over to the research research um, and talked to a couple of scientists. And about a year and a half, I went into my boss, John Luttrell, who was also my boss in Washington, D.C. He was the assistant director and my boss boss was Tom Hamilton. He was my real, real boss. But anyway, they were both my boss and they were both charting out my future. And so I went in to tell John, who's now the regional forester, I'm like, John, this is great. But the regional office isn't much different than the Washington office. I want to get out in the field, in the dirt, where they make decisions, where they take care of cattle, where they take care of trees, where they cut down trees. I want to be out in the field. So I like your support. Um, I heard the Willamette is coming up with a public affairs officer, and I'd like to go. I'd like to apply for it. He said, Gloria, you really need to learn one job before you go after another. Okay. okay. I got to my desk and I said, I'm doing this job well. If there's more learning to do, it'll come up before I leave. I can chew gum and walk at the same time. So sometimes you get encouragement and sometimes you get a little ding that says, um, stay in your place. Well, I had goals to reach, and I didn't like the idea of somebody telling me to stay in my place. So I went down to the Willamette National Forest before they advertised their, um, their public affairs officer job. And I, I talked to the, the forest supervisor, Mike and Mike, Mike Edwards, Mike Edrington and Mike Carrick for supervising and his assistant. And I said, Mike, I hear you're coming up with a public affairs officer. He hadn't announced it yet. Um, I would like to apply for the job. And I'm going to tell you why I think I'm going to be the best candidate for it. I read your draft. I've talked to some of your rangers in some of your communities. Sorry, I know I didn't ask permission, but I asked permission of the rangers. And I think I know what's needed. And so I will work with your planning staff and we will publish this plan. His was behind. It was supposed to be published well, probably four or five years ago. So he was way behind and it really needed to go out because he was getting past the deadline. So um, I said, okay. I said, but I want something from you. I would like you to give me a sabbatical to Oregon State University so I can get the necessary credits to be a forester. And then I want you to let me be an assistant ranger for one of your rangers. Okay, oh, okay. I know they didn't believe me, but I said, okay. Well, I did get the job. 
I didn't do any training. I didn't do any travel. I kept my head to that final. The districts and I, we had all kinds of meetings, um, listening to the community and the big, the, the community, but the big thing was they didn't want them to continue to cut as much old growth as they were cutting. And the Willamette's mantra was a billion a bust. And that's just that they saw what it was doing to our ecosystem and our environment. So what happened was that the Willamette was at something like 800 million board feet when we started the process. And when we did the numbers, it was down to 457,000 board feet. And Mike could not stay. He, he, his heyday was gone. He couldn't stay. He needed somebody who's more um, able to pull out a program like that. But before Mike left, I, um, he signed my papers. I went to OSU for a year. Was it a year and a half? I, I went to OSU. I didn't have to work. Um, I came out with my um, credits and I went up to the Rigdon Ranger District to... Um, can, I, can I jump in here? I'm sorry to cut you off, but we're, we're running into some time and I'd like to turn to questions. Okay. Um, if you're okay with that. Yes. Okay. Let me grab one here. Um, it sounds like your success is due partly to being curious enough to ask questions and be open to learning. Can you speak to this? I think you're right. The asking questions part is trying to figure out what you have to deliver to whoever is hiring you. When, they, when, when you're interviewing, you don't want them to just tell you what they can do for you. You want to do your homework and tell them what you can do for them. What was the second one, Kim? Uh, being curious enough to ask questions and be open to learning. Okay. And so as you're researching, you may have questions. I had questions all the time. And, um, but being open to whatever feedback you get is also important. Communication is so important. Relationships are so important. Mentor, mentors are so important. And these guys, they say, well, how are you going to get more people of color and women into these organizations, especially with the new way they do the, the application? But what I would suggest is attaching a piece to the application and telling them why you would be the best person for the job. Women used to be shy about that, but not now. If they're either going to pick you or they're not. So give them that boost of saying, this is what I can do for you, and I do it well. Um, do we have another one? Kim? Uh, uh, what is it about the Forest Service that made you decide it was the agency you would pursue your goals in? Well, I had no choice. It, was, it wasn't, it, I didn't select that agency. I was um, only working there as a second, uh, second um, payroll for my family. My husband worked in uh, construction and he made the most money. But when he died, I realized I wasn't going to be a, a reporter and I wasn't going to be uh, a radio commentator, and so I needed to find money to, to support my kids. And so um, that's when I put this, the plan together and the strategy together to work my way up into that service. And a lot of times I was the only black woman at the table. And this is funny. When I was a public affairs officer, and I was the only black woman at the table, I'd make a suggestion, right? 
I'd say something. And the guys would keep talking and I'd chime in. Then the guy comes up with the same suggestion that I had made. And now all of a sudden, everybody's toning in. It's a good idea. You can't let that kind of stuff stop you because they, they do that. You have to be strong and you have to have fortitude and you have, to ha you have to know that there are people out there who don't want you to succeed. An example of that, the regional forester here in Portland, deputy regional forester, had me a job, forest service job. It was going to be my first forest service job. And um, it was going to be down on the Ashland Ranger District. The, the ranger was leaving for maternity, maternity leave for a year, and they wanted me to take that job. And I thought about it, and I had, I had detailed and had some friends down there. But I thought, you know, you can make a mistake that first year, but you take that second year and you fix it. So... I was uncomfortable that if anything went wrong that first year, I would be, I would be keeping other African-American women from being a forest supervisor. So I said, no, I'm, I'm not taking that. And um, went to the BLM, had a great, um, as, as I told you about the miners and the Native Americans. And then they got, I got a call and they said the Sayusla National Forest was over and they hoped that I would apply. So I did. Um, this is another thing to be look, to look out for. I got the job, but the boat had so many holes so many holes and I'm like oh my god that's probably why I got the job so the first thing I had to do I had to get the forest out from an injunction that the environmentalists had against the Sayus law the Willamette the, the, the Olympic and the another one Mount Hood and um so I am invited all the environmentalists to lunch um, to introduce myself. And I did. I said, I want to introduce myself. And um, I, I brought a few um, papers that speak to uh, my successes in, in, in the past. And I am anxious to get out there on the ground, continue gyms, we will cut no more old growth, improve habitat for, for salmon, take out dikes, take out roads. I'm, I'm prepared to do that. I said, I don't want you to judge me on the same grounds you judge the guys. And I know you don't know me, but I am telling you we'll build a really wonderful relationship as we work together in those watersheds. They went to the judge and asked her to relieve me from the indictment. Then I had to go find some money because you can't do anything if you can't keep your, your people um, and be able to do your products. And there's a, a friend that I had Margaret, she worked in the regional office um, doing partnerships. And Margaret was a close friend of mine. My daughter babysitted her kids. I said, Margaret, Jim left me a ship with full of holes. Is there a way you can find me some money? She said, by the way, I actually have a... a um, grant that I'm working on from, from Ecotrust. It's a half a million dollars. 
She said, I will uh, suggest to EcoTrust that he uh, considers the Sayuslan National Forest based on what Jim Furnish had already done. I got that 500 million and there's a lot of good stories. Any more, um, Kim? You guys got questions. Forgot to unmute myself. Uh, so we ha we've had several along the lines of um, who or what inspires you? Where do you get your drive and your confidence and what keeps you going to do the work that you do? Who inspires me? Well, there are some women that I looked up to like uh, Nancy Grable and, and Elaine Zielinski, but my real inspiration comes from my kids and from inside of me. I mean, once you make your mind up, you, you have to do the work and you, I'm also a May baby, so that's like a, are we bulls? I think we're bulls. And so we just pull our way through. Um, but that all the days hadn't been great. I mean, when, when he said what he said in Montana, I went home and put the pillows over my head and cried. When I had to, had to leave Portland to go to the Willamette, leaving all my th three children up here, um, I had to go to the ocean and talk to their dad. I, you know, it's, but then you, you, <laughs> you meditate, you know what you want, and it's so important. Do your homework. Go for it. Was there another part to that question? That was that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, African Americans still represent only 4% of the total workforce in the USDA. Uh, what can we do to encourage more minorities to enter the STEM or agricultural fields? Well, what we've done so far hasn't been working. Um, an example was I had, when I became forest supervisor in Sayusla, I had three kids from the 1980 colleges um, working up at Tillamook. And someone called me and told me they were walking back and forth to their motel to the job or in the street. And worrying for their safety, I called the ranger. I said, this, isn't, this is not acceptable. You know, all they need is somebody to holler out the N-word or look at them funny, and they won't think they're in a comfortable place. I said, you're going to give them one of the green cars out of the fleet and you're going to tell them they use that car to go to the motel and come back to work. I didn't know I could do that. You can do that. Send me the papers. I'll, I will sign them. Now, if that was a, a white forest supervisor, the message probably would not even come in. Nobody would have called him to tell him that these kids were walking back and forth. So he would never know. He might have done something about it, but he would have never known. And the kids would never complain. But because of who I was, and because I brought those black kids in, they said, oh, I better let Gloria know about this. So, um, it, <laughs> To do, to get more people into Forest Service, into the upper echelons of any organization, you have to have a real good hook. You have to say, say at one of the 1880 colleges that are doing wildlife or doing um, on forestry. You bring maybe 10 of that group and you bring them into the Washington office. Set them up with a tutor. Tell them that 
the goal of this organization is to make you successful. And once you are successful, we will be looking for you to bring additional success into our agency. And this goes for white women too, because when we started downsizing, a lot of the white women, our biologists, our hydrologists, they were let off, our archeologists. Um, and so it goes for the women as well. Um, I think the hardest thing about uh, black and white relationships is we don't know each other. And once you build a relationship and you know that person, it's, it's really hard to hate them, especially if she keeps you laughing all the time, which I'm good at. But <laughs> you, you have to go for it, ladies. You have to have a goal, have some skills, be determined, don't take no, and go for it. Any more questions, questions Kim? Uh, you, you've mentioned before the importance of mentorship. Were you able to mentor um, young uh, African-American women or anyone else in your career? And what kind of advice would you give to an African-American woman interested in um, a career in forestry now? Yes, I was able to mentor uh, Chandra. Oh, God, Sandra's last name is I'm missing it. But we met on the, um, somewhere over in Eastern Oregon, on the Rogue, Rogue River. And she was in public affairs, and I was in public affairs. And everything I had done, I shared with her what she should do. And uh, there was a position coming up, and I told her exactly how to go in to position herself to get it. And she did. And I am very proud to say Chandra has gone up into the agency. She always liked medium and media. So she stayed with that part of the organization. Um, but she's doing a fabulous job. Fabulous job, and she bl she cl she blames it all on me, and I'm like, no, 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 no. I could say as much as I said, you did the work. Take the credit. Um, if they're coming in today, I don't really know the organization that well. I am a group of on a group of old Smokies, and that's all the old guys that retired and like me. And uh, they have a lunch uh, once a month. But they don't really, the reason Forrester comes in and talks to us, but I don't, he doesn't talk about hiring or, or, the, abil or the ability of bringing in more people. I think you would have to do some research to find out if, I don't know if they have an affirmative action office or, just a regular personnel office. Um, uh, if if you if you email me, um, a good friend of mine, Barbara Washington, was in uh, classifications, and um, well, she worked all four five branches of the personnel office. She may be a better one to be able to tell. Um, you how to do it. Um, but don't be afraid. Don't, don't be, see, I, everybody thought I was going to be afraid to go and work in a white office. Everything around me is white. My husband's white. My friends are white. Everything's white. But I enjoy my friends. And if they had been black, I would have enjoyed my friends. That's my personality. I want people to like me, but I do it by presenting myself in such a way that it makes it, makes it easy 
for them to say, I want this person. I want this person in my organization. Does that help just a little bit? I think so. We've got some foresters in the audience who uh, say that Chandra's last name is Terry. Aha, uh -huh. yes it is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so a couple more related questions. Um, how, how would you recommend that people kind of deal with sexism and misogyny in the workplace and, and how do you have strength to get through this when people are, for example, stealing your ideas? Um, Happen once, don't worry about it. Happens twice, don't worry about it. If it happens a third time, you call them out. And you have notes of when the other two times he did the same thing. Now, I, um, I have, a, you've got to be brave when it comes to um, harassment, misogyny. Um, I had a for a supervisor, we were all at a party, and he blew on my neck, you know, I, and I thought it was like a bug, and then it came again. And I looked at I'm like, what the hell are you doing? I'm trying to get your attention. I said, well, it would be better if you just walk around here and look me in my eyes. He said, what was wrong with that? I said, go home and blow on the back of your wife's neck and then come back and tell me what was wrong with that. And then I went to my ranger. I didn't, I didn't say who the, who the um, board supervisor was, but I went to my ranger and I reported it to him. If I said the name, the ranger would have had to do something about it. But the ranger, too, didn't see anything wrong with that. Nothing wrong with blow, blowing on, a, softly blowing on another woman's neck. And I told him the same thing. You go home and you um, have your wife. You blow on your wife's neck. And then come back and tell me what you think. And he said, when he came back the next day, he said, Gloria, I get it. You should. Men should not be blowing, if they're not your wife, on other women's necks. Um, I'm, I'm pretty outspoken and I, I'm, what, how do you say it? I, I'm, I'm pretty outspoken and I'm, I know when I'm being harmed and I was being harmed in Montana, so I had to leave. Um, I... The best way to challenge someone like that is to call them out. And I think women were brought up to be afraid to call them out. But I think we're different. I think we're to in a totally different pivotal time in our lives. And learn how, practice it. You got a brother, you know, let, have him pull you on his lap. What the hell? Don't be pulling me on your lap. This is not what I'm here for. I'm a specialist. Practice it at home. But learn how to um, learn how the best way to get yourself out of a situation like that, but call them on it. Because if you don't call them on it, then there's no reason for them to change their behavior. We had a regional forester in Montana who was um, molesting his granddaughter. And as soon as it got out, Forest Service kicked him out. And of course, there were criminal charges brought against against him. But you never know who you're going to run up against in, in when you're working in close proximities. But I do know if you do, do your job well, and unfortunately, if you're a person of color, you got to do it extra well. Um, 
you you will be you'll be successful you'll have a su successful career and the minute you get to another stepping stone and it feels like a glass top is over there then it's just get back to work how do i how do i get through this glass top but skills listening writing communicating mentoring and all oh, don't remember any of the other build a relationship you can build a relationship and they don't even know you're building it nothing build a relationship anything else coming Connie? you know what that is a perfect point to stop we are at three o'clock um, I want to thank you, Gloria, for taking time to talk to all of us today. I want to thank everyone who came and who was patient through our technical difficulties. Uh, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it, and we hope to see you at another event sometime soon. Uh, I just like to end by saying, if they have purchased books, if Marty will send them my address, I will um, I will autograph it but you have to send me the postage to send it back to you. All right, Marty will figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do we leave now, Marty? I'm leaving. Did Marty want to come back on and say a few words? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Okay, so. Right. Bye, Gloria, thank you so much. Bye, see you later, Kim. <laughs>